morning, everyone. I'm Megan Cullop, along here with Scott Micklin. Good morning. It is Thursday, December 10th. Yes. Week 39. Yes. We're saying, right? We, we are saying that because that is true. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to remember from Monday. It's been a couple no days. No alternative facts here. No, no. But welcome, everybody. It's our COVID-19 Community Information Program on KSJE, and we're glad that you are with us. We have a great show uh, planned for you today. We've got some great guests coming up. Secretary Bill McCamley from the State Department of Workforce Solutions is going to be calling in in just a few moments. We'll be speaking with him about some of the unemployment benefits that have been made available for New Mexicans. And also, uh, Dr. Bob Underwood's calling in, too, the uh, chief medical officer from the hospital. Yes, very good interview. Yeah, we talked to him yesterday, just so folks yes. know. You can't see the future predicting the future no. about how good an interview it is because we already talked to them. That's right. Yeah. Though, which we become apparent when they look at the wardrobe change. Maybe that's true. Yeah. But we have not yet talked to Secretary McCamley, but I not. predict it will be an excellent interview. Me too. Okay. <laughs> he won't let us down. He won't. He never does. That's true. <laughs> so let's get started. Have we had him on before? We have. Oh, right. We have. Okay. I know. Week 39. It's okay. Right. They all blur together. It's, it's okay. It's nothing personal, Secretary. Right. Let's get started, though, and talk about testing because, again, the uh, schedule has been released for next week, and we can kind of share that with everybody about um, the testing dates and locations. Again, the location has moved from San Juan College to McGee Park. This seems to be a permanent change. Yes. We've talked about that. I think the cold weather. And so um, today in the afternoon, 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., testing at McGee Park. Tomorrow, 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., and then next Monday from 9 a.m. to 10.30, Tuesday, December 15th, 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., Wednesday the 16th from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., Thursday, December 17th from 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m., and Friday, December 18th, 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. at McGee Park. Yes. So, again, the information to register ahead of time so you can get the results and they can get you in and out fairly quickly. Um, all those things remain the same. Um, cvtestreg.nmhealth.org, 327-4461 for our radio audience. There's a number to call if you need help to get registered. Right. So, there you go. The other thing we want to mention, too, is uh, the saliva-based rapid testing. We mentioned this on Monday, but again, it bears repeating. It does. I think. It's happening every day from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Judy Nelson Elementary School. And again, these are free from the Department of Health. It is a saliva-based, so it's not the swab in your nose. It's the swab in your mouth. Right. Right? Yeah. It's a self-swab. Self-swab. So you swab the inside of your cheek. There you go. Yeah. So, have you done it yet? No. I've... I have swabbed my own nasal cavity that's how right often we get tested yes i'm just like talking another, to my neighbor while doing it at uh, this point okay well this is another option so i guess this if you ever do this one report back let us know i will how it goes it's time for you i think to try probably it's time for you to get out there okay i might do this one so yeah. we'll see anywho <laughs> it's uh, 10 a.m to 3 p.m every day Judy Nelson Elementary School in Kirtland, that's 44 Road 6580, and again, um, you enter off of 6575 and go around kind of the school building and then enter through the kind of north side once you drive around the building, but that's how you get in and out of that testing location in Kirtland. Mm -hmm. So, another, uh, again, free testing for um, New Mexicans in San Juan County, and again, the idea is to try to find out where the positives are and to quarantine and stay away from people and not spread yes which is why we're seeing the Stop cases the spread the numbers that we're seeing which yes. we'll get to in just a moment also by the way there is a uh, drive through family flu shot clinic scheduled for the San Juan County Public Health Office on December the 18th from 2 30 p.m. until 1 30 p.m. so again if you still have not yet gotten your flu shot um, you can take advantage of that that's the free uh, shot as well Right. So definitely, there's there's that. It's always good. Yes, exactly. Um, Johns Hopkins. We have the latest numbers from from them. They've been tracking, of course, this for all for low these thirty nine weeks. Low, yes. low these thirty nine weeks. Yes. Um, so United States confirmed cases are now at fifteen million three hundred ninety three thousand one hundred and sixty four. United States confirmed deaths are now at two hundred eighty nine thousand four hundred and fifty one. Yeah. Yeah. They're still. And the United States is still, I mean, and I feel like that, that gap is broadening. Look at these numbers, right? Like India is at 9.7 million. Oh, with our and cases? Right. And right. we're at 15. I think we're increasing faster than a lot of other countries, yeah. if not all other countries. Right. Because Europe is finally kind of settling down, I heard. The Economist yesterday. Okay. Good. Right. 
Well, Great for Europe. You were hoping that ours will get there soon. Yes. Ours will slow down. Hopefully we can look at them as an example. But Right. But again, it's still uh, still up there, and the deaths are, are very high. Again, I keep going back to that 250,000 kind of mile marker that we mm-hmm. noted, and um, it doesn't seem like it was that long ago. Mm-hmm. And here we are with another um, almost 40,000 deaths right. in the United States. So there is that. Uh, in New Mexico, there was a bit of a glitch this week from the New Mexico numbers. They weren't able to release numbers on Tuesday because of a glitch. They released the Tuesday numbers early yesterday morning and then release the Wednesday numbers Wednesday afternoon like they usually do. But um, but they are caught up. But the numbers show about another 1,759 new cases in New Mexico from just the one day. That's Wednesday. For a total now of 112,950 total cases um, since we started. And again, um, I remember when we hit 100,000 in New Mexico, which wasn't very long ago, but our we're getting 1,000, 2,000 cases a day. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's going up so quickly. San Juan County, I believe that's a record, unfortunately. Um, 209 new cases just yesterday for a total now of 7,211 cases in our county. There were 34 additional deaths in New Mexico reported yesterday, but thankfully um, none in San Juan County. So our numbers of fatalities remains at 255. And recoveries are up as well, Uh, 333 new recoveries to report for a total of 40,058 recoveries in New Mm -hmm. Mexico. Mm -hmm. So... That's so good. this is positive news. It is positive news. And and again, as we've talked about um, a little bit on my program yesterday, we talked about this new um, family medical clinic opening by the hospital. And uh, they were talking about the COVID to home program, which we've talked about on this program we have. as well. We have. And, you know, if, you're, if you have COVID but you're not horribly sick and don't need to go to the hospital, right. they have this other program to help you recuperate at home right. under a doctor's care or a nurse practitioner's care or at right. least some medical professional's care to check on yes. you. Yes. So I think that's a great use of that resource. Yes, so. for sure. That's so, such a good idea. Yeah. So there's that. Um, other numbers we want to share, the Navajo Nation, of course, they have another 191 new cases yesterday. They're now reporting their total Active cases at 18,575, five additional deaths across the Navajo Nation for a total of 693. And again, they are still under this additional three-week lockdown, which now goes to basically the end of the month. And we've been talking about that as well. And so, and there's the other story about the other lockdown on December 28th. And again, this is from ksje.com slash news, uh, where we put all these uh, news stories for you. And so uh, we invite you to go check those out and make sure that uh, you're aware of some of the things that are, that are going on. That's where we share a lot of those things, a lot of those stories yes. that, are, that are coming in. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about a little programming change because we want to let folks know that we're going to be here yeah. next week, uh, Monday and Thursday, and then we're going to be off for the holidays. We are. So... That's the plan. But I think during the holiday season, when we're not doing this show, we're still going to be sharing news and information on our website and on our Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, all those places. Right. So So make sure that you guys stay on the beat. Yeah. Please follow us We'll be on the beat. We just won't be here. Right. Exactly. I love using phrases like the beat. There you go. Now, if things get really off the charts crazy, we'll, we'll be back on the show. Right. During the break. Yes. I'll drag you in. Well, or we'll I'll already you, be working we'll in my you other... from your bathrobe and slippers, and you can join us. Okay. I'll be working elsewhere, but yes. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Also, who wears a bathrobe? I thought you did, but no. apparently not. Okay. No, no, no. Thanks for... Jeans all the way. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go to the watch list, shall Little we? Bit of, uh, let's do that. Insight Quick, into Megan. than not. Megan at home. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. This is the watch list that has been uh, compiled again by the New Mexico um, Environment Department. And, of course, for every... Uh, rapid response to a local business. They mm-hmm. report it here. If there's more than four, then um, there's the possibility that there would be um, the business could be shut down. Although the state is kind of, as we've mentioned, relax those a little bit if the business agrees to do regular testing of its employees. And so that's why we're not seeing um, the closures as much as we were like when the West Main Walmart was closed mm-hmm. for those two weeks. So anyway, the new list is out from yesterday, and it includes Hill Corp in Aztec on Road 3100 with two rapid responses. Malloy Honda has two on East Main in Farmington. Overwrite Trucking in Farmington has two rapid responses. Uh, Vector Bank in Farmington has four. Uh, McCormick Elementary in Farmington has two. 
Ojo Amarillo Elementary School in the Fruitland area has two. Nijoni Elementary in Shiprock has two. And Shiprock High School has two rapid responses. And again, there are no closures, though, on the, on the list from San Juan County. Yeah. They're, they're closing things down in other counties, but not here. Yeah. So. I mean, and, you know, I'm super happy that businesses are agreeing to test their employees. That is such a simple, helpful way to flatten the curve again. Right. Because it needs to be flattened again. And we'll hear Dr. Underwood talk more about that capacity issue. Exactly. Um, so, so. That, so, yes. And that, I think, is a good response so that they're not shutting down, especially these essential stores that, you know, where folks were saying when they shut down the West Main Walmart, that was a hardship. I think for folks who may have to pick up prescriptions or groceries yeah. or, it is. or whatever. It so, is. Yeah. Um, but I know they want people to be safe, too. We can't right. have people spreading it in a store either. Cost-benefit analysis. There's so much of that going on. It's very hard. It is very hard. That's true. We're all, we're all new at this. Let us remind Even ourselves Even the politicians. Again. It's only That's been 39 true. weeks, so we're still all new at this. Well, you know, there is no... The last people we had to rely on are not living anymore from the last pandemic. You mean the, oh, the 1918 yes. pandemic? No, not really. So that's yes. very that's very true. Um, Want to talk about a couple other things to benefit the Echo Food Bank because yes. again, uh, we know folks are struggling. So we want to share this information as well about some uh, food giveaways and distributions happening. Um, again, there's a couple tomorrow. Um, one in Farmington at uh, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. This is the Echo Food Bank Dairy Meat Produce Food Box Distribution um, together with Shamrock Foods. That's at the Echo offices there at 401 South Commercial. Uh, first come, first served. No ID, residency, or income requirements. And so that is happening from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. tomorrow, December 11th, at the Echo Food Bank on South Commercial in Farmington. Okay. And then uh, also tomorrow... Uh, we have that. They're also doing the um, backpacks for kids and uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. And the children have to be present to pick up a backpack on this um, distribution as well. And the lineup will start at 8.30 a.m. from Miller Street to Elm Street. Very good. On Farmington's south side. And then the other thing we wanted to mention was another distribution the same day tomorrow at 4 p.m. at Blanco Elementary School. And so, again, and they're asking, and this should go without saying, if you picked up a box in Farmington, please don't drive to Blanco by four and get right. a second box. Right. That's just for those folks in that part of the county. Right. So. Yes. That just should go without saying. Yes. But there you But go. we're going to say it anyway. We're going to say Just to make sure. Exactly. That's right. 4 p.m. tomorrow, Blanco Elementary School. And, again, um, same thing, first come, first serve, no ID, a residency or income requirements. And so um, – we want to be able to share that with you as well. And our thanks to the folks at Echo Food Bank. And we're going to tell you later in the show how you can support the Echo Food Bank. There's some food drives going on yes. to collect food for Echo. Yes. So, yes. so that's what's happening. That's great. So there you go. I believe we have our first guest yes. on the phone. Let's go to them. Let's go to the phones. And uh, good morning. You're on KSJE. Thank you so much for calling in this morning. Uh, good morning. This is Bill McCamley. I'm the Workforce Solutions Secretary. I was asked to call in at this time. Yes, Secretary McCamley. Thank you for joining us. We're glad to have you on the show, and uh, welcome back to KSJE. Um, we know um, there's been some changes, some additions to uh, the unemployment benefits in our state because of the special session, and we were hoping maybe you could give us and our audiences a little bit of an outline on, on what has changed. Sure. Well, there's, there's basically one simple change, and that is there was some money from the original CARES Act. So this was the bill passed by Congress in March with a lot of money for state and local governments to help through uh, getting Americans through this pandemic. There was a decision made in the special session to turn some of that money that was gonna go to help government agencies directly back around and help New Mexicans specifically. And so there was a, a grant for some low income New Mexicans who didn't, um, get the original federal stimulus check. There's a whole new business grant program that small businesses can apply for, nonprofits and such to help them. And for unemployment, there is one simple change. If you are certifying, um, either completing the process last week or this week, or you have completely exhausted your claim uh, from September 12th to that Wednesday before Thanksgiving, which was the day of the special session, you will be receiving an additional one-time $1,200 benefit. Uh, we will start rolling out those payments next week on Monday. They will be rolling out in groups. So some payments will go out 
Monday night. Um, more will go out Tuesday and Wednesday. And please understand for the folks that are listening to this that might be getting unemployment, that it generally takes 24 to 72 business hours for those payments to transfer. So if you're in the program and you think you're eligible and you don't get a payment right, right in early Tuesday morning, it's okay. Um, we'll be having payments go out throughout the week and they generally take a little bit of time to go into account. So that's kind of it. Yes, and I do uh, have a follow-up question. Part of what I had read about this was that folks didn't even have to apply, that if they qualified, that was an automatic thing? Yes, ma'am. So basically what we ask people to do is uh, just fill out your regular unemployment certification forms. In unemployment, if you're on the program, you have to what we call certify every week that you're still not making wages or that you're making wages under what we call your weekly benefit amount. It's a form everybody's got to fill out every week to get unemployment. If you filled out that form, either last week or this week, uh, for two weeks ago or last week, because the issue with certification is you always fill it out uh, for the week before you are filling the form out for. So if I'm filling it out this week, it's for last week. And the way that the bill was written in the legislature, uh, we are interpreting that to be the two-week period. So either you got it, um, you were on unemployment the week of Thanksgiving or the weekend after. All you have to do is fill out your regular form. There's no extra application. There's no reason to call our office. There's nothing else you need to do. And we will get that money rolled out. Very good. And Secretary McKinley, I wanted to ask you too a little bit about, um, you know, just how New Mexicans are, are faring. We know unemployment is high. We know folks have been struggling. Obviously, this, this extra benefit is going to be um, very welcomed in a lot of households, if not all households across the state that, that qualify. Um, I imagine you're watching with great interest the uh, negotiations in Washington for additional um, unemployment relief um, as this pandemic kind of goes forward. Yeah. What? Um, we, we don't know where those are at yet. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously still some very large disagreements in Washington regarding the program. Uh, what we tell people is this, look, we're, we're going to monitor that situation in Washington. And if some of these programs are extended, we'll work as hard as we can to get those rolled out as soon as we can. The problem that happens in Washington sometimes is they wait till the last minute if they do anything at all. And these programs don't turn on in the flip of a light switch. You know, it's not like snapping your fingers and the program goes forward. We have to wait for rules from the Department of Labor. If there's any changes in the programs that we had over the spring and the summer, we have to make those test them in our T system so it doesn't crash the whole thing, and then we get them out. So we're monitoring that as, as, um, as closely as we can. We do have a little bit of experience doing these things now, and so we can get things out a little bit faster than we uh, maybe would have been able to do in April. But that's all we can do is wait for Congress and the president. And if they do something, we'll work to get it in as, as soon as we can. Right. And so because this this right, this update is a one time uh, twelve hundred dollar check. And so and we're anticipating this thing to to drag on longer. And uh, so am I hearing you correctly that as soon as the higher ups in the federal government act, you guys follow suit immediately? Well, not immediately. That's what I was trying to say before is that as quick as you can. when they make a law and the president signs it, um, we still have to wait for rules from the Department of Labor at the federal level because we are kind of under their um, accountability mechanism. So if we don't do things that they want to do, they can uh, take all the money they give us to run the system. All of our money pretty much for unemployment, the system itself comes from the federal government. And so we have to follow their rules. Now, we have advocated to Congress. In fact, I was just on the phone call yesterday with the National Governors Association and a lot of staffers from Capitol Hill that they make the program as simple and easy as possible. Basically, just extend what we already had on the books, and that will make it easier for us to get it going. Um, and the simpler they make it, the faster we can get stuff rolled out. But once again, we have to wait to see what, if anything, passes before we can comment on how fast it can be implemented. Certainly. Understood. And Secretary McCamley, I wanted to ask you a bit about, we've seen some additional unemployment benefits from the federal government, and I think through the state 
government, if I'm not mistaken, but please correct me if I'm wrong, of $600 a week or $300 a week. Is there any magic number or anything that you would like to see in your, in your job as a Secretary of Workforce Solutions that, that tends to go better? Is, is more money better for everybody, or does it need to be kind of a, a proportioned uh, amount based on what folks were, were earning before they lost their job? You know, I, I think the governor has been pretty upfront that we just want to see something get done. They're having those discussions up there on Capitol Hill. Uh, we have made our position known that something needs to get done. People still need help and that the program needs to be simple to implement. What that is, um, is it, frankly up to them. We just really are advocating strongly that they get something done and let us get the help. And let me tell you why. We have over 100,000 people now in the state still receiving benefits every week. Um, this is more than 10 times what we had the week of March 9th. This has been hard on everybody. And there's a lot of folks out there that really, really desperately need help. Unemployment as a program was set up in 1935 and did not take into account all the folks nowadays that are contract workers. And it never really was meant as a long-term benefits program to provide people everything they needed for you know, six, eight, ten months, which is where we're at now. The average New Mexican gets $300 a week on unemployment. And that's simply just not enough to live for any length of time. It may be enough if you get fired and, you know, get work two weeks, two months later or whatever, that's fine, but not for this kind of length of time. And so we do think that additional benefits are necessary. We need, we understand that they need to extend programs for people. Uh, there is starting to be a light at the end of the tunnel um, with this vaccine. We're hoping to hear good news from Washington today, but that's still going to be a long time. You know, the governor said, hey, look, this is going to be a complicated process. There's not going to be enough vaccine for everybody right away. They want to make sure the healthcare workers and the folks living in long-term residential facilities, the real high-risk people get it. I know the governor has expressed a real want for teachers to get the, the vaccine as well. Um, but that's still going to be a ways off. And so people need help. They need it desperately, and they need it now. And that's why we are urging Congress to do this, and we're going to work as hard as we know how if they pass something to – get as much money in people's pockets as fast as we can. Very good. Well, Secretary McCamley, thank you so much for joining us this morning and giving us your time. You're welcome. Y'all have a good day. Keep your heads up out there, all right? Definitely. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. That's uh, Bill McCamley, Secretary in New Mexico for the Workforce Solutions Department here on KSJE, talking about unemployment benefits. And um, it's got to be, it's almost like, driving a ship, you know, steering a ship and you can't turn it on a dime when the stuff comes down from Washington and trying to update, you know, yeah. your your computer systems and, and to change things around. Yeah. So anyway. So that's... Cheryl Crow lyric. Okay. Takes a little bit of time sometimes to get the Titanic turned back around. Hopefully this is not a Titanic situation. Hopefully not. But certainly same, a big ship. Same idea. Certainly a big ship. <laughs> certainly a big ship. So there you go. Yes. Very good. Okay. So um, we were talking a little bit about uh, Echo Food Bank mm -hmm. and some of their food distributions that are happening today, uh, tomorrow, pardon me, tomorrow in Farmington and Blanco. And I wanted to also mention that there is a um, event happening to donate food to the Echo Food Bank. It is through the uh, Farmington Chamber of Commerce and some of their member businesses um, in lieu of their annual um, gathering, which always kind of was a, you know, mission was a mm -hmm. can of food or whatever to get in the door. We can't gather, of course, but um, non-perishable goods can be dropped off um, to benefit the Echo Food Bank. So again, Farmington Chamber of Commerce at their new offices here at the Quality Center for Business, 5101 College Boulevard in Farmington, also the Kaiser Levitt Insurance Agency. That is uh, near downtown at 300 West Arrington. That is Barron and Arrington, that intersection. Right, right. right. My old stomping grounds down right. there by the Civic Center. <laughs> So there's that. And uh, you can also go to the Courtyard by Marriott, which is open, I think, all the time, right? The lobby of the hotel sure. is open all the time. And so you can drop it off um, there at 560 Scott Avenue. And Remax is not accepting donations, but they are a sponsor. So we'll give them a plug yes. for that. So, And some of the things that they're looking for, um, canned tuna, chicken, peanut butter, vegetables, soup, stew, ravioli, cereals, rice, pasta, I'm hungry. No, I'm hungry. Yeah. See what happened? <laughs> look what look what happened. I know, right? Well, you want to read the rest of the list? Yes. Because you can read just as well as I can. Thank, yeah, off thank the you. Screen. Well, and, and it starts with stuffing mix, which is like one of my favorite things. Ever. Right. That's and, that's my shelf stable item. There for you sure. go. Instant potatoes, sweet potatoes, gravy mix, canned pumpkin, chicken broth, and canned fruit. 
There you go. So any or all of those things is what they could use, and uh, you can drop them off at the locations we mentioned uh, earlier on the program. And again, at the Quality Center for Business, I was told that the donation box is kind of in the vestibule, if you will, so you don't even have to go in right. to the building, because then if you do that, you're gonna want, they're going to want to check your temperature right. and have you sign in. But you can just go in to the first set of doors and drop off your food and get out and get in get yeah. out yeah do yeah it safely. there is a simple formula you know when you go to the store i'm going to get one for me one for somebody else and this yeah. is the the best way to to look at that i know folks that you know bless their hearts do that every time they go to the store oh. holiday season or not so right they're, I, they're saint, I know there are saints among us right yeah no kidding exactly so anyway well let's talk to our other guest shall we yeah and because uh, we had a great conversation with um, Dr. Underwood, that was happened yesterday, but this is still very timely information. Yes, let's do it. Joining us this morning to talk a little bit about uh, the situation at San Juan Regional Medical Center and some other thoughts about what is going on with COVID-19. Dr. Robert Underwood is joining us on the telephone this morning, the Chief Medical Officer at San Juan Regional Medical Center. Dr. Underwood, welcome back to KSJE. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Megan. Glad to be on. Thank you very much. Well, let's get started by talking a little bit about what the um, the governor was talking about earlier in the week, and that was this idea that our hospitals are getting to that maximum capacity. And so um, she was going to be, I think, talking about a, a process where care could be then rationed around around the state because just the beds are, are running out. And so I guess two-part question. Um, are we in danger of that happening here, Dr. Underwood? And I guess what would the procedure then be um, if and when you have to implement something like that, a triage type situation? So that's a, it's a multifaceted really kind of question, Scott. I would say that this is something that are, and we call it crisis standards of care. It is a known term in the world of incident command and disaster management. Um, a lot of times people think of crisis standards of care around a hurricane or some other natural disaster. You know, clearly this is on a little bit of a different level, but these are contingency plans that we actually already have worked through in terms of modeling, et cetera. So it's a, it's a number of things that are considered, and we don't know if and when we're going to get to that position, but we have plans that are in line, and there were uh, and we work with folks at the state level to talk about what's happening. That's one of the beauties that I have seen in New Mexico that I don't see at other places is that we work really hard to cross level. In other words, if, if you remember in the spring, we were having a very big surge of patients and other areas were not seeing that and we were able to transfer patients around to keep us out of crisis level of care. The question is, is is the entire state going to experience this at the same time and then do we have to get into some level of crisis standards of care now when she talks about that and when you hear about it generally you're saying that you're running out of the capability to treat all of the patients that are coming into your facility in one way or another now does that mean number of beds we have a backup plan for that in terms of where we would put beds, doubling up rooms. All of the rooms at our hospital are private rooms, but do we have the capacity to put two beds in a room? The answer is yes, we do. So that's a contingency plan that we would have. Um, the other is around uh, medications. And so we're actually starting to work, actually have been working on, okay, if there's not enough of this kind of medication, what is a reasonable substitute and how do we go about an auto substitution of one medication for another based on what the pharmacy supply is. Um, others that everybody is concerned about is what if we run out of ICU beds? And the intent is, and we have a great capacity, we've already exercised it um, once last week just because we started to get more patients. We have um, essentially 14 licensed ICU beds at this hospital. We turned our, our mid-range beds, what we call PCU beds, into ICU beds already. So we've already moved from 14 to 23 and our cardiology floor, which is the fifth floor of the hospital at the other end from where labor and delivery is, um, those beds are capable of high-end monitoring. And all of those rooms are capable of being turned into ICU beds as well. And we actually have put a couple of people in that contingency area. We haven't had to 
ration or limit or anything else so far at our hospital. And, and it's a continuum, and that's why I say that it's not like, okay, we're here and we pull the trigger and then it's a free-for-all. That's not at all the case. This is a very systematic way that we look at what are our capabilities and in what areas and how do we transition kind of from one phase to another. Um, already, and we're not at crisis, but we are at contingency. Um, so our staffing ratios, for example, are different than they would be if we were under normal circumstances. Uh, nurses and CNAs, nurse assistants on the floors, may be taking care of more patients than they would normally take care of under normal circumstances because we are being expanded and we are being stretched. All of those things are taken into account. Um, we also have uh, backup plans. We, ha we ordered more ventilators, so we have more ventilators now than we did back in the spring. But we also have the capacity of taking anesthesia machines, if they're not being used in the operating room, and turning those into ventilators. Um, so all of those things are, are, are looked at, and we talk about them, and then we look at, okay, at what time do we phase from one to the next to the next. Very good. This is very encouraging to hear. The last thing we want is another dystopian nightmare on our hands. Um, I do have a follow-up question regarding the cardiology floor, um, because obviously since this began, the hospital has been very clear. If you have an emergency don't, that's not COVID-related, don't not come in. If you think you're having a heart attack, get in there. So if you're Absolutely. converting these floors, if you're converting the cardiology floor, where do those patients then go? Is there like another floor that's now mixed and not COVID? That, that's correct. Typically, our third floor is, um, and our second floor, third floor is primarily for surgical patients, um, and we have tiered down our surgical case volumes, so there's room on that floor. We can still move telemetry into those areas, so we can continue to monitor those patients. Nephrology, which is uh, for kidney disease, is on the second floor, and we can move patients into those areas as well. So we still have um, we still have beds available at this facility for sure. Good to hear, Dr. Underwood. And I wanted to ask you too. You mentioned about being able to maybe double up some of your beds in some of your patient rooms, and and if we needed to, um, you know, adding adding more capacity and things like that. And and then it goes back to staffing. I guess you know you you you're talking about maybe staff that's dealing with more patients than they normally would. Is there is there a maximum? Is there a time when you have to say we can't add any more beds because our staff just literally can't handle any more patients on a daily basis? And, and that gets to where it becomes a state level issue because we, we look at that staffing capacity as well um, at all hospitals across the state. There is now a state level kind of central command that looks at who's got what capacity in what areas. So can we move patients over so that we're not stretching any one person too thin. I guess really my point though is, 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 is that a possibility? Well, certainly it is a possibility. Do I think we're going to get there uh, to where we can say we just can't take anymore? I don't think so. Uh, nonetheless, um, the patients have to be cared for. And so we will stretch thin. And that's where you get into that crisis level of care. In other words, what do we start to curtail? You know, if we say that, um, I'll use physicians for an example, that our hospitalists, who are the doctors who typically take care of the COVID patient, that there are more than they can see in a day if everybody is working. Then there are contingency plans to mobilize providers from our community who may work in a private practice now but used to work in a hospital. We, we have talked to them about potentially coming back to the hospital and working. If we hit crisis standards of care, then there are um, there are certain understandings, I guess is the best thing to say, that in that declaration, which does come from the governor's office, uh, that says, okay, the standard of care for which we care for patients is different. And so if we have a physician who's working well outside of what they would normally be doing, then they are protected by the state and covered by the state under um, kind of a tort uh, claim position, uh, because at that point, we're trying to do the best for the most people that we can, um, and that's really what the focus shifts for. If you, 
generally as clinicians we think about you know how what am I doing for every single patient to make it the best that I can and the focus shifts for what do I do for the most people that I can under these circumstances um, and it, it it sounds a little squishy, and maybe that's because it is. We we can't predict exactly where we're going to hit certain areas. We've started working on the likely things, and I mentioned those earlier, pharmacy, bed capacity. Um, documentation is one of those things. You know, we take relatively copious notes as clinicians in a hospital, but that takes time. And if I can take that time and actually go see a patient and put some orders in, then perhaps my time is better suited there and then I, I fall behind on my documentation. I don't document as much as I might otherwise. Things like that are what we consider. Very good. Now, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Go but, ahead. Uh, oh, I was going to say, the, the last one, and, and uh, there was a, uh, in an, an article in the Albuquerque uh, paper, Dr. Denise Gonzalez is uh, kind of heading up uh, part of it, but we also look at ventilator allocation if we ever got to that point, and we have a series where we look at um, a scoring mechanism over um, the survivability potential. If we got to a point where we had more patients that need ventilators than we have ventilators, again, I don't think we're going to get to that point, then we actually have a scoring mechanism that looks at prognosis. And so the people who are most likely to survive would be the ones who would get the ventilator. And that's gone by a scoring mechanism in terms of laboratory studies and uh, lung function and oxygenation and some other factors are put into that. But it also takes the judgment away in a way so that you're not, you don't have the risk of a value judgment. It is really looking at scientifically these are the best people to put on a vent if we don't have enough of them to go around. Very good. We hope it doesn't get to that level, of course, no but exactly. it's good that, that we is. have that plan. Yes. Yeah. So what we are doing in, in terms of preparation, I loved this analogy it was shared, is, is remember those big 64 crayon boxes? We're sorting the crayons and getting everything ready and hoping we never get to use them. Right, that's right. Um, so let's go to the vaccine beat, as I've been calling it, um, the most recent news. Um, I know that Pfizer is slated to go before the FDA tomorrow, December 10th, which by the time this airs will be today. today. There you go. Um, so, and I know that you have been, of course, following that closely and uh, had recently even read the report. So can you give us um, the scoop there? You bet. And so there's a lot of technical components uh, of it. And I know, um, uh, Megan, you said you like to nerd out every once in a while. And it, this is really, really cool stuff. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. There she goes. Uh, yeah. So the vaccine uh, comes in, in uh, two doses. Um, we do anticipate that by next week, people have been saying mid-December, well, guess what? That's next week. Uh, that the vaccine would be available. We do expect the FDA to hear this. They've already had the report submitted, and we do feel that relatively quickly after that they will be issuing an emergency use authorization. Um, we know that we will be getting vaccines in. This vaccine from Pfizer requires a um, super cold storage capability, and we have the freezer capacity to do that, so we will be kind of the hub of storage within the county area. Um, it is two vaccines, one given uh, would be called day one and then on day 21 or day zero and then on day 21 you get a booster vaccine. What's really interesting is that the studies um, that are showing that even after your first vaccine, about 10 days after the first vaccine, there's a very high level of immunity to the COVID virus. Um, that's after the first one. So uh, by the time you get the second one, your immunity is quite high. Again, they're reporting a 95% efficacy. Efficacy is really the comparison of, of the people who got the vaccine compared to the people who didn't get the vaccine, then they are basically 120th the risk of those who didn't get the vaccine to get the infection. So very, very low. And again, I point out that the most of the people that got sick after the vaccine got sick within the first 10 days after the very first one. 
Interesting. And so that booster, I guess, really does what it's designed to do, right? To really help these patients, at least according to the studies we're seeing. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the intent. Uh, so the other is that this is an mRNA platform, and so it, it, both vaccines are the same. Um, so it's not that you have one and then the other one augments it in some way. Um, the, the, there are symptoms with the second vaccine, um, maybe some with the first vaccine, but certainly with the second they're showing uh, body aches, myalgias, maybe even low-grade fevers, but that's because your immune system has already been triggered. So when it starts to see this, um, what the body would view as an attack again, it's mounting its response. And your, your immune system is doing exactly what it's supposed to do to fight against it. Uh, so um, the, that's a really good thing when we see those kinds of symptoms. And it may sound scary, but as I read from a physician who actually was in one of the first study groups, that on his 21 day, it was about a day and a half that he didn't feel real well, but he said, hey, it's better than getting COVID-19. Yeah, of course. And I'm so kidding. I oh, I'm sorry, Scott. I was, say no. I was agreeing. Okay. I was agreeing with everybody. <laughs> okay. Yes. It's, it's hard to tell sometimes. But um <laughs> so I uh, I'm now working in healthcare. I know that the vaccine that first um sort of I don't know, release of it is going to be primarily targeted towards healthcare workers as well as yeah. folks that live yeah. in assisted living. Now, is there like some sort of concern as far as, you know, staggering how many healthcare workers get it at once so that everybody's not like low grade fevering around at work the same day? Yeah, actually, that's a really good question, Megan. And and yes, we're we're looking at that very very carefully. So, uh, generally speaking, the especially bedside workers. So, uh, first to answer your first question, yes, there are priorities that are being assigned um, in terms of who was first priority, and and naturally the bedside caregiver is highest on that list. You know, to, to gird them with the armor, if you will, of protection when they're working with the COVID positive patient every day. So yes, um, we do have a priority behind that and the, the frontline workers are the first people that are on that list. Now, second question or second part of your question is yes, we are trying to stagger that. Generally, a bedside caregiver will they work generally 12-hour days, um, not all, but generally do. And so what we're trying to do is hit them at the end of the number of days when they're going to have a couple of days off before they come back so that they have an opportunity to recuperate prior to their return to work. Again, it's the second vaccine that we're more concerned about that, um, but we're really looking at, okay, how do we time this right so that um, the people are getting taken care of and they don't have to come in and try to work through that, that they're able to relax um, and do what they need to do um, in order to recuperate from that second vaccine. Very interesting. And uh, Dr. Underwood, maybe final question for you, and that is just, you mentioned that this vaccine has been developed in a, in a unique way, certainly a fast way. It's the fastest development of a vaccine, I think, ever. Um, and there are some folks who are maybe understandably concerned about taking a vaccine and, and being concerned. And I guess my question to you would be, you know, by the time that we have enough doses to maybe um, get down to the level of maybe Megan or me, um, no, no. Remember, I'm in healthcare now. Oh, see, I get you to may go be first. at the front towards the I front get to of the go line. First. Well, we'll see what happens to you. <laughs> but my yeah. my question is, um, you know, we will be studying all these patients, right, who are going to be getting this yeah. vaccine to be able to have more more data in addition to what has already been compiled and collected from the early tests to just see how how effective this vaccine continues to be. And so, uh, would do you have any concerns about taking the vaccine? Is my short question after that long uh. introduction. <laughs> First off, as soon as my priority level comes up, I will have my sleeve rolled up and there'll be a needle in my arm. Gotcha. So, okay. So that, that's my level of concern personally. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually have some immune issues, uh, medically speaking, but I still am going to get the vaccine. And, and I think that uh, most people ought to be uh, in that same ballpark. Now, a couple of parts of your question. First off, um, yes, this has moved along very quickly. Um, part of the ability that for it to move along very quickly is that a number of the processes which are normally done in series have been done in parallel. So while one thing was happening, normally they wouldn't start that next phase until the, the one that they're in is finished, but they actually just they started it at the same time. 
so that we could see the results of things in a more rapid way. Now that doesn't help the people who, in, in the results of, okay, who got vaccinated, what are the long-term effects? Um, so the studies that were released by the FDA show an end point out from day zero of vaccination. This is in the phase three trials, so this is the big group of people that got it, out to day 112. And so what's that, a little more than three and a half months. Now long term, uh, we will continue to follow these folks as well as the, the people that will be starting to get the vaccination uh, within the next couple of weeks all across the United States. And of course, they started vaccinating the population in the UK yesterday. So yes, we will continue to follow it. Um, however, the other thing I want to say is a lot of concern that I've heard is this quote unquote new technology of an mRNA vaccine. Uh, so it's a messenger RNA and you have to get into cellular structure and how proteins are made to kind of understand what the mRNA is. But we've actually been studying the mRNA platform as a potential for vaccination since the 1990s. So it's not like that is so new that we just said, hey, I have an idea. Let's take something into a lipid bilayer and implant an mRNA, which in turn will get into the cell and generate these spike proteins. But that kind of thought process happened a long time ago. It's just the new genetic sequence for the particular spike protein is the only new part of that. And the other thing that's been, remember I had, I told you it had to stay really, really cold. Once that mRNA is injected, it goes in and it does its job for a little bit, but then it degrades and it goes away, um, which is also encouraging about how the mRNA vaccine works. Very interesting. Very good. Well, Dr. Underwood, thank you so much for joining us this morning. As usual, we appreciate all the time that San Juan Regional Medical Center folks devote to us. We know you guys are clearly busy. Yes, but we appreciate it. And we appreciate uh, being on. You know, I have to say thank you again uh, for helping share the message. And it's really important that, that we share the information with our community, and you're a key role in that. And the other thing I want to say while we're on the air is uh, the, the caregivers here at the hospital and in our various clinics are working very, very long hours under very stressful conditions right now. And um, we cannot appreciate them enough. The effort and the willingness um, and, and the dignity in which they approach the task is humbling to be part of that team. Very true. Well, we appreciate all the work that they are doing and that you are doing and the team there at San Juan Regional Medical Center on the front lines and all the uh, information that you share with us every time you're on. So thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. You are welcome. Appreciate it very much. Dr. Dr. Bob Underwood, Underwood from San Juan Regional Medical Center. <laughs> are we, like are we sitting in a canyon right now? Right? A little echo? <laughs> echo, echo, echo. There you go. Anyway, but definitely appreciate his, his information. Yes. Um, you know, the situation you know what I loved at the about hospital? that interview? What? Can I just, can I just say? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I loved that this is a stressful topic. This is a topic that when you say, hey, our capacity is... You know, it's a scary situation. And to lay it out in such a calm, you know, structured, like this is, don't, we have these plans, this is how this looks way, is just this great, like let's take it seriously, but let's not fear monger. And so I really respected him for that. I thought that was an incredible true. job. Very so. true. Well, and I'm not surprised that they already had a plan. No, no. Should. But, you know, to, I but, mean, right. it's just nice to hear all the details. Yeah. You know, somebody like me needs the details, man. Right. And they have it. And, and now you have, have it. it. And now, and now I have, you it. have it. And now you guys have it. That's right. So, That's very true. Yeah. So anyway, we appreciate everybody watching and joining us today. Again, we invite you to share this program. If you feel like Megan, that it's important to have this information and share it and, yes. and have it, please share and join us again next week. We'll be on Monday, of course, and Thursday. And we're looking forward to being with you and sharing more information about our community's response to COVID-19. So in the meantime, Stay well and stay safe. Wear your mask, wash your face, and we'll see you back here on Monday morning, 9 a.m. Have a good weekend, everyone. Stay safe.